now that Norman's here, we can start. Most of you already saw. Uh, we did print up a pictorial directory. If you don't like the picture, it's not my fault. Uh, take a look at your driver's license and just compare. Uh, these are pretty good. We printed up enough that each family, that is each person that's pictures in here, can grab one copy at this point. Now, most people want two copies, one in their car and one, I don't know. So I will print some more, but for right now, if you'll just take one and then we'll print some more for next week. Uh, if you will. Now, there's also over on the little table uh, a non-picture one. It's just one piece of paper front and back and everybody's name and address and phone number and email is on this. And you can take as many of these as you want. Uh, well, start with two and uh, let everybody have one. Okay. I'm glad to do that. Uh, it's not the Lamb's Book of Life. So if there's mistakes in there, it's not an internal problem. Uh, some of the pictures I didn't get before I was ready to print, and we will try to print up some pictures and you can paste them in uh, later on. But we're gonna make another directory next year. So don't worry about it. We'll just do the best we can. Well, we're going to have a different series of lessons. Uh, I want to start with a prayer before I announce all of this. If you would join me, please. Our Father, as we come before thee this morning, we thank thee for the day, for the measure of rain that we have. We pray that you would give us even more. Father, we know that you care for us, you love us, you protect us. Father, we're so thankful that you have revealed yourself to us. As we set out to learn about you this morning, we pray that we can learn about your great character, about your nature that we can have more confidence, that we can learn to love you with all of our heart. Father, we pray that you would keep us back from presumption, that we would not tread into that which we're not able to understand or know. But Father, give us wisdom that we can understand and apply. And with that, we will worship thee and serve thee all the days of our lives. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said in John chapter 17, that this is eternal life, that you might know God. Uh, there are several other scriptures that are similar to that scattered throughout the Old Testament that uh, Jeremiah said, this is what I want them to know, I want them to know me. Uh, and as opposed to all of the uh, false gods in the world. And what I've learned is, first of all, most of the objections that I've run into from people that are not uh, Bible students, their objections about God are not about God. They're about what I call a caricature, not a character, caricature. They have this image of God that they have created and it's wrong. And so one of my friends was having a discussion one time and a guy, uh, he said what he hated about God. And my friend just looked at him and said, well, if that's the way God was, I think I'd hate him too. But that's not who God is. Let's study and look. So what we're going to talk about uh, is two things, and then we'll come back and do some more talking about God. Number one is the very nature of God, particularly with the Holy Spirit. Uh, that seems to bring up more questions in Bible classes uh, than uh, the other issues. And the second one we're going to be talking about is the very concept of what it means for us to be near God and for God to be with us or near us or in us. Uh, and one of the problems, W.L. Wharton, an old time preacher told me one time, he said, remember, when you're reading the Bible, you're reading somebody else's mail. And this was mail that was sent 2,000 or more years ago in a different language to a different culture to different people with different uh, backgrounds. And if you simply apply a 21st century American understanding of words to this, you're very likely to come up with some wrong concepts. So we're gonna just talk about God, the Holy Spirit, and uh, what he does and how he does that with us. And so we start at the beginning. Best place to start, in the beginning. 
God. And one of the first things that always pops into my head was, where is that? How could he exist without the universe existing here? If he created the heavens and the earth and there are no heavens and earth, where was he? And how does that work? Let alone what did he look like and what? Now, we don't have any of that information. All we have is, in the beginning, God. And so we begin our study of God. And one of the things you realize is God in the Bible is revealing himself to us. We don't have a picture of him, but we have a word picture of him. And one of the word pictures is all of the names that they use of God. And uh, the two that are used uh, with many, many add-on parts is the word El or Elohim. El meaning strength. Uh, and then Yahweh, which is translated Jehovah in the old King James. And that was God's uh, covenant name. Almost every time you see that, it is in reference to God and his people in a covenant relationship. Uh, so, he is God. He is God Almighty. He is the God that sees. He's the God from everlasting to everlasting. He is the God that will provide. He is the Lord, the master, uh, the, the master who heals, the Lord who is my, my banner, my life. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what they kept doing was using uh, Yahweh and Elohim and adding these uh, qualifiers on the end of it. And if you did nothing else but go through your Bible and circle all of that and memorize it, you're going to have a pretty good picture of God. What does God mean to me? What does God do uh, for me? And so we're going to not deal with every one of those, but we're going to start with some of the simple ones. First of all, in the beginning, God. And that means God is. And when we talk about God, there's all kinds of things we've just learned from that little chart. God is from everlasting to everlasting. Who created God? Dumb question. And I don't mind telling people that. Uh, uh, God was not created. God always existed. He just is. In fact, that was what he told Moses. I am. And that, that word is so hard to translate there that because it, uh, I am that I am, self-existent uh, on that. Uh, and that is that you and I live and move in God, by God, for God, with his permission. God just is, always has been, always will be. And I'm already blown out of the water. I don't know how to, I don't know how to comprehend that. Uh, everything in my life has a beginning and an end, including you. And there is no beginning and there is no end with God. So God is also infinite as opposed to meaning finite. He is non-finite. Everything about me is finite. It has limits. Uh, there's limits on how high I can jump and how fast I can run and what I can remember and what I can't remember. There's just limits all the time. How many of you push against the limits? Uh, always wanting to be able to do just, you know, a little bit. But with God, there are no limits. And so part of that is God is omniscient. That is, God is all-knowing. Everything that can be known, God knows. Now, what is it that God doesn't know? You know, I actually have a book that he tried to explain what God doesn't know. And that was the stupidest section of that book. I mean, because if he had explained it, then God would now know it. <laughs> but uh, there's so much we don't know the mind of God. We can't even begin to comprehend. If you've never done anything else, watch some of the documentaries that simply talk about uh, our universe and our uh, world that we live in. God has pre-known all the things that needed to work together. Uh, so all these years, we've had DNA, and it's been working. 
Well, God created that in the beginning because he knew this is the way things are going to work in the chromosome. And, uh, so God's wisdom, God's knowledge is without limit. But God is also unlimited in power. And I have no idea what that means. Just that if he wants to do it, he can do it. Uh, wow. God said, let there be light. There's light. I tried that in the office here the other day, <laughs> and it didn't work. I turned on the switch, and it still didn't work, so I tried. Anyway, you all get this picture. God's power. He can simply speak things into existence. How much power did it take to breathe life into Adam and Eve? We have no concept. We have no idea what life is. We know when they're dead, but we don't know uh, life. But God not only knows and understands, he was able to impart unto you and me and Adam and Eve and everybody else uh, this and uh, part the Red Sea. I was talking with a friend one time and he said, you know, in John 1 it says in the beginning he was God, but then verse 14 says God became flesh. And he started in, he says, now in order for God to become flesh, he's going to have to... And I just stopped him. I said, I don't know what you're going to tell me, but you're just making it up. Because you don't know what it would take for God, an infinite being, to become flesh. You have no idea how that works. And neither do I. I just know that that's what it says. And I learned a lesson from that. Sometimes you just have to accept what God says about himself because you may not be able to explain it. You may not be able to comprehend it. You may not begin. Try explaining uh, differential equations to a four-year-old. Well, try explaining them to me. Uh, and, and the problem comes is there's just things that we are unable, but God has unlimited power. And then God is everywhere present. And that's what we're going to talk about in this particular lesson. What does that really mean? The first time I began thinking about this, an old-time preacher out of Alabama, one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life, uh, Brother Franklin T. Puckett. And uh, he was talking about this, and he says, Now, when you say that God is omnipresent, that doesn't mean that God is omniperson. And what he meant by that is the presence of God is everywhere. But the person of God may be a different subject. <laughs> and so uh, you're going to have to chew on that, and we'll think about this as we go on. God is holy. He's righteous. He's merciful. He's kind. He's gracious. He's forgiving. He's also judgmental and wrath and jealous and all of those. And here's the problem that I have. He's all of those to the same extent all of the time. How can he be both wrathful and loving at the same time? My answer is, well, you are. <laughs> oh, we at the same time. Uh, the difference being is he's impartial in his and uh, truthful in that. But part of the problem we make is we begin cubbyholing this. And so God is angry at this time. But over here at this time, he's merciful. And I want you to just kind of picture the nature of God doesn't change. The character of God is consistent at, at all times. I wish I were. I work on him, but I've got a long way to go on that. And then it says in uh, Paul's writing uh, to Timothy that God is invisible. What does that mean? Okay. It doesn't mean he can't be seen. It's just in our three-dimensional world with light and darkness and eyeballs and the brain, and the, uh, God is not visible to us. Uh, now, will he be at some point in time? Don't know. Hope so. Uh, but even that, we're going to talk about what God did do. And then John 4, verse 24, God is spirit. And I said this a couple weeks ago. What do you know about spirit? And I finally learned one thing. Spirit is not flesh and bone, Luke chapter 24. But that just tells you it's not flesh and bone. What's it like? What does it look like? How big is the spirit? How many spirits can dance on the head of a pin? They debated that about 300 A.D. Uh, 
I don't know who won that debate. It's kind of a silly thing. But anyway, my point is, we don't know size, shape. Uh, uh, God is spirit. And he demands and wants those that uh, are of spirit to, to worship him. And that, that's us. So we're going to worship him. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I'm going to ask you to do the impossible. You've just stepped back from the universe. You have just stepped outside the universe. Where'd you go? We don't know, because we can't do that. But God did, because God existed outside of the universe before he created the universe. Now, one of the problems we're facing today is so many people, when they picture God, they picture God... And he is inside the universe and he is limited by all of the things of the universe. The size and the shape and what you can do and the materialism and, and all of that. And I just want you to back out. When you think of God, he's not restricted by our universe. He created our universe. He was outside the universe when he created it. He's still outside of the universe. Uh, and so always remember that. Although... Do you remember how Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6? Our Father, who art where? Art in heaven. Heaven is used in several different ways. And uh, basically in that passage, it means in the dwelling place of God, wherever that is. And so in the beginning, that's where God is, always will be. And that, but he permeates his presence, his power, his wisdom permeates our universe, but he's not part of our universe. He's the creator of the universe. So when I try to picture God, I always try to picture God outside the universe, not limited by space, not limited by time, not limited by uh, all of the things that you and I uh, are always limited by. Did anybody else get up at 430 this morning? Now, here's the interesting thing is, y'all shook your head no, because you understand time. And that is, okay, there's a time to be up and a time not to be up. Uh, but there's, we're all constrained by that. Can you imagine what would it be like to not be constrained by time? What if there was not a before and after? Now, see, you can't really picture that. You're going to try, but picture if, if everything just is. If next week is as clear to you as today is and the same as for 4,000 years ago, we can't even begin to picture uh, this concept because we are limited by time and materialism. But God's not. Uh, God created the universe and the time and the experience that we have. So uh, when uh, Solomon built the temple of God and then the glory of God, the Shekinah in the Hebrew came and uh, dwelt inside the tabernacle and, and the, it was so bright and so glorious that the priests couldn't go into the tabernacle or the temple there. And yet Solomon stepped back and said, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple? When the glory of God filled the temple, where was God? Now, I ask dumb questions, but I'm just trying to get you to think. Was God in the temple? And the answer is, well, yeah. But was he still in heaven? Was he still in Egypt over the Pharaoh? And the answer is yes, 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 uh, because God just is. Now, that is the idea of omnipresent. Uh, Psalm 139, the psalmist said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Where can you go to get away from God? And the answer is nowhere. What if we go to Mars? Yes, yeah. 
He's remembered. So this is the omnipresence of God. Jeremiah, God said, am I a God near at hand and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, says the Lord? And then Jonah, when he was told to go to Nineveh, he decided, no, I'm going to flee from the presence of God. He apparently had not read Psalm 139. So he gets on a boat and he's going to head to Spain. But on the way, there's the storm. And he tells the men and the men realized that he was trying to flee from the presence of God. Did it work? And the answer is you can't do it. And he couldn't do it. What if he had made it to Spain? Uh, eaten by a bear or a lion. I don't know. Something else would have happened. God was there. You can't do that. Now, what we then have is a word. Uh, it's called a theophany. And the beginning of that, theo. And what does that make you think of? Theos. The Greek word for, for God. And then you have the word uh, phanei. And that means to... Uh, uh, appear or an apparition and what we have here is we have an appearance of God or an apparition of God and that's the best word that we can come up with because God allowed himself to appear in a way shape form unto different people did they actually see the whole of God I didn't put this in your book, but you remember that episode uh, when um, Moses said, show me your glory. And God said, I can't do that. It'll kill you. No man can see that. And Moses said, I want to see it. And God said, well, you stand in the cleft of the rock over there. And then using uh, uh, anthropomorphisms, describing God in the human terminology, God put his hand over the, the cleft in the rock and the glory of God passed before and God showed Moses his hind part <laughs> and not the front. And I have no idea what all that means. I just know that God let Moses see part of the glory. And of course, after seeing that, when Moses came down, what did the people see? Moses now is reflecting the small part of the glory of God. And they said, you got to cover your head. <laughs> you got to, we can't stand to look at this. It's this. Do you know how bright that would have been? What was it they actually saw? Man, there's so many things I wished I could actually take a time machine and go see. And, and it's these types of things. So God appears in the Garden of Eden. In the cool of the evening, the Lord walked and talked with Adam and Eve. Anthropomorphism, I don't know if God walks. But what God did was he allowed himself to appear unto them in some form that they recognized it was God. And then, of course, after they sinned and God said, where are you? What did they do? Well, they tried to hide. But where can you hide? And that was what we've already discovered. You can't hide from God. And so they were trying to do the impossible on that. Uh, at Mount Sinai, uh, Moses saw the glory of God as he came down and dwelt on top of Mount Sinai and the thunder and the cloud and the lightning and the sound of a trumpet. And it was so fearful that it says Moses himself <laughs> just fear and shaking. You never seen anything like that. I don't care to see that one. <laughs> I'll let Moses have that picture all to himself on that. Uh, then Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, they saw the God of Israel. They went up. Well, y'all getting the picture here? They didn't really see all that there is of God in all of his glory and all of it. What they saw was a vision, a picture, a, an appearance, an apparition uh, of God. God allowed them to see something that they understood clearly. That's not normal. That's not part of our normal world. And that was God. And they saw that. The amazing thing to me is, do you all notice Nadab and Abihu got to do that? And then Leviticus chapter 10, they don't show reverence for God. 
Uh, you would think that with that side on their mind that they would fear and quake, uh, but, but they didn't. Anyway, Exodus 33, Moses entered into the tabernacle and the pillar of the cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. And so uh, here is Moses inside the tabernacle and I don't know what he saw. Uh, but God appears. In 1 Kings, it came to pass, the priest came out of the holy place uh, when Solomon dedicated the uh, Solomon's temple. And then the cloud filled the house of the Lord and the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. I don't know what they saw, but God uh, showed, like he did with Moses, a portion of his glory unto them at that time. So, what I want you to begin seeing is, this is what we know about God, because God tells us on that. God is from everlasting to everlasting. He always was. He always will be. God is invisible. We can't see God. Uh, God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. And God is omnipresent. Wherever you go, God is with you. Now, I made a whole bunch of trips over to China. And... Uh, when I first started going, uh, all my brethren were f scared to death for me. And I'd never been. I was curious. I wasn't scared because my friend had been a whole bunch of times, and he always came back. Uh, so, uh, But one of the things I was assured of, God's with me. And if I go over there, I'm as close to God there as I am here. Uh, in fact, after I went a few times, I think I got closer to God uh, just from my experience and seeing what you do on that. So this is God's presence. But the presence of God is one of those, I call it a figure of speech, because you're going to talk about this. And you all use the same language and uh, uh, the Bible talks about it all the time. Uh, it represents either the attitude of favor or disfavor. Uh, God is close to those that he is showing favor to, and God is far away from those who are rebellious and sinful. Now, the fact that I just said that, where is God when he's far away? And this is why I said, if you can just keep thinking this, you're going to get through this. God is still everywhere. But in some sense, he's now far away. And in another sense, for other people, he is nearby. But it's not talking about physical location. You and I are physical, material beings, and we think of things in location. But I want you to begin thinking of God in the sense that God is omnipresent everywhere. His presence is and wherever you go. But there is a sense in which you can be far away from God and a sense that you can draw near unto God. And that last part, drawing near unto God, is talking really about God's availability uh, to help you. Uh, that God will. Where Abraham left his homeland and started traveling, and God was with him. The interesting thing in Genesis to me is that every single one of the patriarchs took a journey somewhere. And every one of them, when they started the journey, God assured them. I will be with you. Everywhere. Whether they went down to Egypt, whether they went back up to uh, Syria, uh, their homeland, if they'd have gone to Mars, God had promised, I am with you. Now, where was God when he was with them? Can you still back up? <laughs> and God is still God. Uh, so his being with them is not talking about location. He's talking about relationship. He's talking about uh, favor and love and doing and what he is doing for them. So, for example, uh, the story of Cain and Abel. And after Cain killed Abel, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Wait a minute, didn't the psalmist say, where can I flee from your presence? So we're using this in a, a, a figurative language here. When he went out of the presence of the Lord, he went away from God. Now, God was still there and God still knew what was going on and God was going to still bring him to judgment for that. And God, OK, but God was no longer his God in the sense of favoring him, working with him, 
protecting him, guiding him. More or less, he's, you're on your own. Scary, scary thought on that. Proverbs, the Lord is far from the wicked. How far? And it's not distance. It's relationship. And those that are going to be wicked, they cannot be near to God. Okay. Uh, Psalm 51, do not cast me away from your presence. This is when David committed the adultery with Bathsheba. And what had happened before when Saul rebelled against God, God cast Saul off from being one of his. And then God just quit talking to him. Before God talked to Saul and told Saul and instructed Saul. And when Saul rebelled this final time, God said, that's enough. And God withdrew from Saul and didn't talk. So when Saul wanted to talk with God or get more information, what did he end up doing? The old witch of Endor. And he called up this, uh, or had her try to call up. Now, this is my opinion. When Samuel showed up, she was surprised. Why? Because she knew she couldn't do that. But it happened. Okay, but you notice it wasn't God? It was Samuel. And so God's not talking to Saul. And even Samuel, when he appears, he said, no, God's done with you. God's not going to do that anymore. Uh, interesting. Isaiah 59 it says that your sins, your iniquities, have separated between you and God. Well, I'm still right here. And God is still where? But what separated was relationship. That I'm no longer in the favor of God. I'm out of favor with God. Hmm. So God is near to those who are in his favor. And God is, is far away from the other. Psalm said, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and such as have a contrite spirit. So if you want to draw near to God, what do you need to do? You need to have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Uh, not proud and arrogant, uh, but humble, realizing this is God. And this is me and I'm not worth being here uh, on that. And then God can be with you. The Lord is near to those who call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Uh, those thus say the Lord of hosts, return to me, saith the Lord. How do you return to God? Where do you have to go? Now I'm going to beat this horse and, until I get you all agreeing with me. <laughs> uh, that may be a week or two. But my point is, it's not location, it's not location, it's not location. Returning to God uh, I returned to God when I lived in San Diego. But I never left until later when, okay. But it's not location. It's attitude. It's mind. It's relationship uh, with God. So James says, draw near to God and he will draw near unto you. How do I do that? You move to Jerusalem. The holy city of God. And the answer is, no. We can worship God everywhere. Because God is spirit and we are willing to worship him in spirit and in truth. So it doesn't matter whether it's on Jerusalem mountain or on the, the mountains of San Angelo. <laughs> I live at the top of the mountain of San Angelo, just up on the hill over here. Uh, yeah, 50 feet up the hill or something. Anyway, uh, my point on this is we can draw near unto God wherever we are. And we can also walk away from God wherever we are, but it's relationship. So Peter said to the people, first sermon, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises unto you, unto your children and to all those that are far off. What in the world did he mean by that? And the first thing that pops into my head is Isaiah chapter 59. Everybody that has sinned is far off. Those that have rebelled against God are far off. But it also may have been talking about the difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. In Ephesians chapter 2, he described the Gentiles as those that were afar off. And what God has done is he's brought the Jews back into relationship, but he brought the Gentiles who were afar off 
back in the relationship and now there's just one body of people. But again, the bottom line is we're one body of people in a right relationship with God. And this is the drawing near unto God. And this was the promise that God had made clear back with Adam and Eve and kept renewing it, that there's going to come a time you will be drawn back to me. Uh, you will be my people and I will be your God and you will dwell with me and I will dwell with you and we're going to have this. And do you all realize we're there? Now, y'all sleeping at 430 this morning while I'm down there having Starbucks and God is with us. He's with you when you're sleeping and he's with me when I'm awake. Uh, uh, he's with us wherever we go because his presence is always there. But more important than that, we're his people. And so we're there with God in a right relationship with God. Wow. I, 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 that is a heavy thought. And I want you to just think about that this week. Uh, God allows us to know him and to, to love him and he will love us and we're in this relationship. Uh, Ephesians 2 talked about the Gentiles who were afar off. So this also has the presence of God. For How many of you have prayed this week? How many of you prayed for something this week? Why? Well, number one, because there are so many things that I need that I can't do. <laughs> I can't provide. And yet I need. Uh, and then there's so many things that I have that God has given me, even though I don't deserve them. So I give thanks. And, that. and then I was studying this lesson. And, and the more I thought about God, the smaller I became and the greater God became. And you just stop and say, glory be to God. <laughs> Praise be to God. Uh, so this whole thing about God's willingness to help. Why do we pray? How many of you think that God will do anything after you pray? If you don't, I'm just going to tell you, you might as well quit praying. Uh, at least don't ask for anything, but God does. Uh, so this I have seen, O Lord, do not keep silent, O Lord, do not be far from me. Do not be far from me. And again, he said in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus promised, uh, baptize them and lo, I am with you. Where? To the ends of the earth. Test time. Jesus was raised from the dead. He appeared to the apostles. And then what happened to him? He ascended. And where is he sitting? At the right hand of God. But no matter where you go, he's going to go with you. Does that mean he leaves the right hand of God? Does that mean he has to get off the throne? And you see, if you can keep these things in your mind, he's still at the right hand of God, even when he went with me to China. Uh, he's still with God when I left Tucson and moved to Texas. Uh, yeah, even in Texas, God is, is still with us and uh, a relationship on that. So those who seek the Lord, but seek it in a false way. God has said, uh-uh, I'm not with you. I am... Well, God is there. He knows what they're doing. He's present, but he is not with them. Hosea, the pride of Israel, testifies to his face. Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah stumbles with them. Their flocks and their herds, they shall go seek the Lord, but they will not find him. Why? He's withdrawn himself from them. Well, where'd he go? He didn't go anywhere. He was still there. He just withdrew his favor, his relationship uh, uh, to them, his protection, uh, the answering of the, their prayers. That's a scary, scary thing when you finally have realized what we do have with God and then somebody walks away from it. What have they walked away from? And that breaks my heart to see people do. And we've all known people that do that. Uh, and you pray that they come back. John chapter 4. Uh, the, the Samaritans worshipped on this mountain. He said standing in front of the Mount Gerizim. And he said but uh, we worshipped down there. Uh, Mount of Jerusalem. He said but there's coming a time when it doesn't matter where you worship. Aren't you all glad for that? You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to go anywhere. You're there. Uh, 
So wherever we are, take the time to gather with God's people. But God is still there. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. But I want you to think of this. Which seat is Jesus sitting on right now? And the answer is no. Why? Because it's not location. He's with us now. Two or three are gathered. He's with them. But how many churches are gathered together right now? You know, China only has one time zone. Did you all know that? It's as big as the United States. Almost. We're slightly bigger land wise. But one time zone. So it's easy for God to be. <laughs> uh, but we split it up into time zones, So it makes it in somewhat easier because the people in San Diego haven't gotten up yet. Uh, so did you know if we all met at exactly the same time? God is with every single group of Christians wherever they meet because it's not about location on that. Hebrews, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. But what are we doing? We're drawing near to God. Now that little phrase, drawing near, the Hebrew writer uses that. I don't know, Jeff, do you remember the counting of that? Seven, eight, nine, I mean, a bunch of times. And in every time, it's not talking about going somewhere. It's talking about between your ears, <laughs> your heart, your relationship, drawing near unto God. And that's what we need to do. And I'm going to tell you, it's easier to come to church than it is to draw near unto God. It's easier to get in your car and drive down here to this building than it is to mentally draw near unto God. And so in a little bit, we're going to sing some songs and then we're going to be led in prayer. And I'm going to tell you, I find that one of the most difficult sections of our worship is praying with somebody else who's leading the prayer. Because I'm going to tell you, I have a lot of things they never talk about that I want to talk about. And then they talk about some things I never thought about. And so the hard part is being led in prayer. One of the brothers one time said uh, that he prayed that he could draw people closer to God while they were praying together. And I'm still thinking about that 30 years later because that's what he's trying to do. It's what we're trying to do to draw closer unto God. So draw near unto God. So God's omnipresence. He's everywhere. He's far from the ungodly. He's near to the godly. He's with us to help. He is among us wherever and whenever we meet. And then it says he is in us. God dwells in your heart. Which ventricle? In the aorta? Why in the heart and not in the head? Uh, why in the heart and not in the, the stomach? And the problem comes is we're using figures of speech here. And it's not location anyway. Because, you know, God is in Jeff over there, but God is in me and he's in Sharon. And God, how can God be in each one? Because we're not talking location. And if you can just learn that, this figure of speech will help you grasp so much of this. And what it really is talking about is you're in the presence of God. God is with you. God is here. God knows. God helps. God hears. God is your God. You are God's people. Don't you love God? I just wanted to try to get this across. And we're going to talk about uh, God dwelling with us and in us and, and how the spirit works. But this is the first thing. Don't ever forget God is omnipresent, omniscient, omniscient. All of the time, everywhere, but he can be with us if we'll draw near unto him. Thank you.